Historically, we've used this eminence-based medicine, which is when we don't have facts, we have lots of experts, and experts will give us their opinion, and that opinion is often what we call level five. But that changed, and that changed dramatically uh, at one point in time. And, uh, I practice at McMaster University, which is located in Canada, uh, in the southern aspect of Ontario. And this has a specific, unique uh, location. It's a location where Professor Gordon Guyot, the individual who in 1990 decided that he was going to change the way we think about medicine, change the way we think about the critical appraisal of medicine. And it was he who actually coined the term evidence-based medicine, the term that we commonly use today, uh, was coined in 1990 by this particular individual who is a professor there and currently works. He initially defined it as the conscientious use of the current best evidence from clinical care research in making health care decisions. And you can see there are three critical areas to that. One is, it requires clinical expertise. Number two, it implies that we're looking at current best evidence, which means there must be a hierarchy of evidence. And finally, healthcare decisions, which as you just heard in the previous speaker, uh, involve interaction with our patients, their preferences, and their values. But the reality is evidence-based medicine is here, and we have to begin to understand these core principles if we want to move in that direction. Why should we care? Well, if you look at standard search engines, there's lots and lots of websites associating themselves with this concept of evidence-based medicine. The British Medical Journal actually counted evidence-based medicine as one of the top 15 medical discoveries over the past 166 years. President Obama has actually rebranded the term evidence-based medicine by calling it something called comparative effectiveness research. He's given lots of money for people who are focusing on it researchers. Really what that is, the same core concept, which is the conduct and synthesis of research, comparing the benefits and harms of various interventions in real world settings. It's exactly what we're aiming to do in this new paradigm. But why should we bother us as practicing surgeons and healthcare providers? Because our patients depend on us to give them the best available therapies. And do we absolutely want to trust industry marketing to guide patient care? In fact, we realize that 53% of the marketing claims are unfounded. And these are top medical journals, and I'm sure uh, are, are prevalent both in the Philippines and abroad. Ask yourself this, what is it that your patients want? And the feel-good words certainly around the world are it must be cost-effective, it must be patient-important, it must be evidence-based, and this word validity. This is the core of what we're trying to do when we're unearthing what therapies work, and what therapies don't. By valid, what we're trying to do is reduce bias. What's bias? Bias is a systematic deviation from the truth. In research, we try to limit bias because we want to be closer to the truth. And in fact, it was David Sackett, who actually was the mentor to Gordon Guyot, who founded Canada's first Department of Epidemiology in 1967. He actually coined the term levels of evidence. So you've seen multiple speakers this morning talk about this levels of evidence. It was actually David Sackett who actually created these levels and in many ways is the forefather of epidemiology or modern epidemiology. He recently was given the 2009 Gardner Award, which is a highly, highly a prestigious award. And many of the Gardner Award winners have gone on to win Nobel Prizes. Um, so he was honored this past year uh, for his contribution to clinical epidemiology and randomized trials. But this is basically what he said. He said, we have a pyramid. We have a pyramid that starts at the top with randomized trials, with the least amount of bias, and moves downward to opinion, which is called level five, which as you can see is highly biased. And so the goal really here is to understand this particular hierarchy when making decisions about what works and what doesn't work for our patients. But when we transition to EBM, I want you to remember the rule of threes. This is something to Adopting three simple EBM strategies as an organization or as an individual can lead to measurable change within three years. For example, let, let's look at the JBGS American. They adopted a very similar hierarchy based upon Sackett's original description in 2003. And in fact, at the bottom of all their papers, and I'm sure you were aware of this, they have a level of evidence rating. In this particular case, this randomized trial was graded level one. But here are some of the things they did. Uh, that changed the paradigm with 
which uh, this journal in which the orthopedic fraternity is moved, they added something called levels of evidence to their articles. They created a section called evidence-based orthopedics. They created current concepts for use. They had instructional course lectures, and they supported numerous data different publications. So they had multiple different approaches to transmitting and transitioning towards evidence-based practice. They also had courses. Uh, with this one particular course called Principles and Practices, one that I've led, uh, but there have been many others. There have been many textbooks um, that have been written on this topic as well. But the bottom line is, by simply applying these approaches to EBM, within three years, they identified more level one and level two studies in their literature. In fact, it went from 3% prior to using these strategies before 2003 to 10%, so well over a three-fold increase in the quality of orthopedic literature by adopting three or more strategies. The, I'll take another example. The Indian Orthopedic Association, they did the same thing. Very recently, they applied the same general tactics. They applied a number of strategies to increase EBM within the organization. And very recently, in 2010, the National Journal recently was indexed. So clearly, when I look at this particular journal, the Philippine Journal of Orthopedics, I see a major opportunity here for the organization. And I certainly see, uh, as many of you do, an opportunity to really uh, uh, improve and let the world know about the work that's being done uh, in this uh, country. But there are real challenges, and these challenges are unique, are not unique to the Philippines. I mean, there's a general lack of education, time, constraints, and lack of priority. This occurs uh, at McMaster, uh, as well as anywhere else in the world. But what can we do? What can you do as members uh, in good standing of the POA? You can lead by example. We use the term not only talking the talk, but walking the walk. You need to educate ourselves. We need to educate our leaders. We need to educate the surgical community at large. We need to de develop very sustainable subspecialty targeted initiatives that are going to move us in that right direction. And realizing that there are so many journals and so many citations that we can't keep up. Um, and it becomes very, very difficult. We also know that we need more evidence-based resources. Surgeons like ourselves, while aware of the concepts of EBM, we typically do lack the skills in the methodological areas of critical appraisal. The existing resources are often too methodologically focused and not practical. That's why we don't read them. We want something that's very easy to read and up to date. We don't have time to look at the myriad of journals and the hundreds of papers being published. And really, we don't have that type of resource. And it was because of that um, that I've been thinking and we've been working at McMaster to develop potential opportunities. And one such opportunity is something that we'll be uh, promoting in the next year uh, called www.myorthoevidence.com. And basically, we'll be focusing on providing all members of the global community uh, opportunities to identify all level one and level two studies. So the best evidence will be given to you every month to your email address. Uh, and I suggest that you consider signing up, and I'll certainly work with the POA to figure out strategies to ensure that all the members are aware of this particular opportunity.